Hello and welcome to the Transmission Podcast. For more information on Transmission and what we do, you can head over to our website. The link for our website can be found in the show notes or the YouTube description down below. Enjoy this session and thank you for joining us. Guys, how's Transmission been? What's been interesting about this year's Transmission? What, have, what has kind of stood out to you guys? What's, what's been working? What's been challenging? What have you gained thus far? Yeah. I would say the reading is a bit challenging. <laughs> Someone honest. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Good. What about the reading is challenging? Is it just the, the amount or the language that you've almost got to learn? Mm. Quite, mm. Quite but the amount is sometimes just so yeah. yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to read it, but and you, it's time to read all of it. It's sure. And it's normally at night, and at night, grew dim. <laughs> 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 Nothing puts you to bed like that. Come, guys, grab a seat, no stress. I know it's been raining, it's been crazy. Yeah, and, and believe it or not, but grew dim is probably the, the easiest guy and dogmatics to read and so uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so just a fun fact um great anyone else transmission how's it been challenges Mm. Oh, that's good. It's exactly that, isn't it? Um, it's this is a light, light work on it. Just scratching the surface, especially of the Holy Spirit. And so, um, what it should do is actually interest you more and help you ask some of the right questions to go some to the scriptures as we'll see tonight great let's have one or two more i was saying to you honestly i wish almost our church service was as encouraging as monday nights are yeah that's cool <laughs> always encouraging yeah and it is difficult to get for example one of these chapters in an hour yeah so it sometimes feel like we're watching and uh, I enjoyed the I think God's big picture we kind of took or could have took our time kind of overlapping chapters but now this isn't as easy no it's not isn't it yeah, yeah a little bit content heavy but um, how good is God's big picture and just uh, having the different hooks to build your whole biblical and systematic theology around again I probably started out thinking that systematic theology is the bee's knees and the more that I read and get into stuff um, and exegesis and hermeneutics, I find that biblical theology is the absolute framework that everything else is built around. Um, cool. Anyone else? How is this chapter? How did you guys find this chapter? Hey, I started following you on Instagram and you're quite the musician, huh? Yes, like it, bro. Yay! Bring the fire. Okay, how did you guys find this chapter? Good. Good? Okay. Very encouraging. Encouraging, underwhelming, overwhelming, whelming. Yes. I find that it's sometimes difficult for me to read and, and immediately wanting to jump to a certain theological tradition than just dealing with the text as it is in the context of the Bible. But sometimes I want to answer that first through my theological tradition and not through actually doing business with God's Word. And so sometimes reading someone else's kind of um, summation and you know, summary of, of the Holy Spirit helps me to once again just ask some good questions and stand still. That's good. Great. Uh, David, can I ask you to pray for us and then we'll get going with uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, thank you that we can be, be together here tonight and uh, we 
we, we thank you for your goodness in everything we all and we thank you that you are the God uh, we are privileged to worship and thank you that we can discover more and more of you mm. and help us tonight um, in the chapter we're doing it we will really touch our hearts and really broaden our view of who you are and just once again thank you for the privilege that we can know you and help us to help us to use this knowledge so that other people can get in there. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So once again, just to say, um, I think it is actually on the title of the book, it is an introduction to systematic theology. Am I right? So look at the front of the book. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, even tonight, um, hopefully we'll discover some gaps in some of the things that Grudem has even discussed. Because how can you try to surmise the work of one of the persons in the Trinity uh, in a chapter? Um, it is, it's literally impossible. And so we are scratching the surface and there's going to be room for... Uh, disagreement, there's going to be room for um, further investigation, but hopefully what we'll do is be encouraged, we'll go deeper, have more questions, and ultimately give more scope for the work of the Holy Spirit. Numatos agios, spirit or wind or breath, the Holy One. So, without giving me Grudem's definition, and so it doesn't happen, what would you guys, how would you define the work of of the Spirit. And so we get a, once again, we're going to build the definition together, so don't feel like you've got to give the whole systematic theology definition in the beginning, but let's start by building a definition. When I was growing up, I always had this idea that, the, or the idea from the church, that <laughs> the Holy Spirit is like a telephone and he's just in you so that you can talk to God. Um, but reading this chapter and experience in the last time, you, if you think of it like that, it's taking away of mm. the divinity of he, the Holy Spirit is God with That's you, right. not just a way to communicate to God, is actually God in you. That's good. That's great. Hmm. Helpful. Um, I can't remember which philosopher talks about the transcendental <coughs> being, like the spirit that's all around us, and mm. I always probably misunderstood their idea as the Holy Spirit and being all around us and working in our hearts. And, but yeah, just what's between us and in us. Hmm, that's good. It almost sounds like. Um, Romans 8 language, it's the spirit testifying with my spirit. And so there's, there's two different distinctions there. That's good. What else? The work of the Holy Spirit. It's a person. Great. It's a person. It's not a mystical thing. Idea or abstract. Even though there is some abstract aspects of the Holy Spirit, it it's is a person, a person within the, the, the Trinity. That's very good. Yeah. What else? And so don't just think Holy Spirit, but the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? He gives life. He gives life. Great. See that right in the beginning. In what way does he give life? We'll probably talk about that later. But, uh, <laughs> Spiritual life, but everything. Great. Right. We mention it, but all life. All life. Great. What about being the water? Being the water. Oh, you've got to double click on that one. Yes. Man, that's good. That's John 4, isn't it? Jesus, the woman of the well. And then later describing streams of living water will now flow out of you. So it's interesting. He gives you the living water and you become a source of living water to the others. Oh, whoa, there's a tweet. <laughs> Great. What else? Yes. Amen. My most churches, um, 
um, the ability to do things supernaturally. Mm -hmm. Um, Fantastic. To feel the presence of God. Great. To um, become conscious of things, other people's needs. Um, and if you believe in the gifts of the Spirit and prophecy, healing, and all of those things. Um, and I guess also reminding us the words of Jesus as well. This is really good word. So good. Man, I was waiting for that. We were kind of dancing around the subject. And hundred percent and we would even the most reformed people would traditional people would agree with all of that probably say amen 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 great what else well, at least i would but uh, <laughs> i would describe myself as reformed but definitely non-traditional Sure. <laughs> and you, 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 you're taking away my punchline for the whole night. <laughs> We're literally at the introduction. And so just repeat that again for everyone. So I said, I, I've always um, believed that the work of the Spirit is to reveal to us the Son. And Grudem disagrees. It sounds like he doesn't really you know, agree with that 100% at least. Or well, maybe that's probably, he says something like it's not his primary work. Great. Man. <sighs> I'm, I'm unsure how I want to handle this because in one sense, I want to park the car right now and say, okay, we're going to spend 20 minutes discussing that. My, my strategy was 40 minutes this and then we're going to do 20 minutes that. So we, we can spend some time on that now if you, if you guys are keen and then we'll go through some of the elements that Grudem is talking about. Maybe we can unpack it a little bit exactly what you're saying. And so, um, hmm, how are we going to do this? And so what is, what is um, Grudem's, well, let's say this. What is Grudem's definition of the work of the Holy Spirit? Let's start there. What is Crudem's definition? To manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. Great. This, I wrote that down directly. Uh, and, and that is 100% <laughs> right. So, so it's something about manifesting uh, the power and the presence of God in the world, especially through the church. And so, so far, it's actually not deviating from what you just said. Um, where we're going to deviate is just, you know, what is the primary role of that manifestation and revelation? Is the manifestation or the revelation of the Holy Spirit as a person of the Trinity itself, that his job is to reveal himself, thereby also revealing God, and reveal his role within the Trinity, or, slightly more different route, is the primary role of the Holy Spirit as we know it, as it's been known, made known to us. So again, there's a difference between what the role of the person in the Trinity might be and the roles that have been revealed to us through Scripture. So as far as it's been revealed to us, some might think that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is actually to manifest, to illuminate, to reveal that Jesus is in fact the Christ, to remind us of the Gospel, to pull us back to the Gospel, to point to the Gospel, to point to Jesus as being King. To, there's another word that I'm not going to use right now. I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on that. Maybe you've got some questions. You're like, this isn't clear yet. Maybe you're one or the other position. Maybe you don't even know what the two positions are, even though I just phrase it. You're like, it just say, sounds the same to me. Let's get some thoughts. No, one else. no go for it. Uh, just ask, maybe it would be helpful to distinguish between what God does and what when you say God, you mean God the Father or the Godhead Trinity? The, 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 like, just God. So, uh, Have you guys done Trinity yet or not? Okay, that would probably help. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, so normally, uh, so transmission runs over two years. We've got a year A and a year B, and so normally... Uh, I think we're in year B. B. 
And so which means if you were in year A, it would have run a little bit more chronological where first you would have done the Trinity. And it's out of the understanding of the Trinity to understand that God is one being, three persons, um, individual, not expressions, not personalities, three distinct persons. And, you know, they, God within their own right, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So understanding that and how they relate to one another actually gives us a little bit more clarity on that the Spirit is, in fact, an individual person of the Trinity, which might be difficult. And there's a reason why I say person and not personality or expression or anything like that. But unfortunately, we don't have time to really dig into that tonight. Um, otherwise, we're going to go into Trinity. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to circle back around it. So we're going we're gonna to discuss some of the things that we clearly see that Grudem is showing us is in the Bible, the work of the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, on an application level, especially on the difference between Old Testament and New Testament covenant, how the Spirit works, we'll probably see some of the differences and some of the gaps that I think Grudem actually has. And specifically, it's called the treaties that we say unity with Christ. And so probably after atonement, the fundamental truth that we need to understand within Christianity is that by the Spirit, we have, we've been unified with Christ. There's this unity that exists within us. And it's difficult to understand that without the Spirit. And so the Spirit's primary work is to keep that unity between us. And so it's much more than just a telephone line. It's actually the, the very nature of what implants us into God and into Jesus. And when Jesus says that, you know, we will in fact be one. But that's, uh, or, yeah, union with Christ. Uh, there's a quote from Athanasius that says, We, apart from the Spirit, are alien and remote from God, and are united with the Godhead by participation in the Spirit. Murray says, Union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation, all to which the people of God have been predestined in the eternal election of God. All that has been secured and procured for them and a once for all accomplishment of redemption, all of which they become actual partakers in the application of the redemption and all that by God's grace they will become in the state of consummated bliss is embraced within the compass of union and communion with Christ. And this is done through the Spirit. And so obviously a big chapter that we would want to add and um, treaties of when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and here's why this is important. Grudem says that because the Holy Spirit is a person within the Trinity, you know, its work simply can't be to point to Christ. It's got to be something more. And yet we know um, in the way that the Son submits to the Father, the Spirit submits to the Son, and even within the submission, within the Trinity, they are total equal within role. And so just because the Spirit is mentioned less within Scripture doesn't mean that He's less uh, in terms of power or in inequality. But God is so sure of Himself and the Spirit is so sure of Himself that He doesn't need to prove that He's an individual within the Trinity. He's got no insecurities or fears about that. He is perfectly happy within the role and submission to the Christ. And so we hear that language that Jesus says, As the Father sent me, so I send the Spirit. And so there's orders or commands being given. There's adherence and then there's obedience. And it's very clear to see Christ's obedience within Philippians 2. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. By the way, if you want to understand the, the role of the marriage union better, you've got to understand the Trinity and how all of that relates to one another just so well, um, how equality functions within different roles. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Okay. We spoke a lot of, about a lot of different things about the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, no one's gotten controversial yet, which is disappointing right now, but hopefully we'll get in a little bit. Um, can I start from my right? Can we get Psalm 104 verse 30? And then can we get John 6 verse 63? Then Numbers 27 verse 18. 
Marnie, I think that's you. Numbers 27 verse 18. And then 1 Samuel 16 verse 13. 1 Samuel 16 verse 13. And so one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit empowers. And now the question is, how and what does the Holy Spirit empower? The Holy Spirit empowers. How and what does the Holy Spirit empower? Let's get some hints from Scripture. What is this Psalm 104? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Psalm 104 verse 30. You can kick us off. Okay. <clears throat> when you send your breath, they are created, and you renew the surf surface of the ground. Great. Let's go to John. Um, John 6, 63. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Mm, that's good. Numbers 27. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Great. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brother, and the Spirit of the Lord rose upon David from the day forward, and Saul rose up. Samuel rose up and went to Rama. So far, what have we learned? How does the Spirit empower? Where and what way does the Spirit empower? And it gives light, and also through the words that use the Spirit, we give light to them, and they also through these words. Great. The Spirit gives life and life. <laughs> so there's, there's this physical life of the breath of God, of the Spirit of God, the Spirit also empowers for creation. So, um, the fact that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead fall under that? Oh yes, for sure. I think so. And, and it's, it's interesting reading different passages. We see that the whole Trinity was actually present in that. Because we see that God the Father is the one who raised Jesus, but it was by the power of the Spirit. Yeah. So, so Primary uh, person with uh, responsibility, but the whole Trinity is there. Yes. So in, in a sense, in a sense, the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, but in another sense, the grave couldn't hold him. Yes. Because he was so pure. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So. That's great. Authority. Yes. Because it says here, uh, you shall invest him with some of your authority. Great. And so the Spirit empowers for leadership. Great. Anything else? Uh, especially now this, these verses. We're going to head to the New Testament in a bit. This is still kind of Old Testament vibes. Capability. It like gives Joshua or David or whatever for the task ahead. Absolutely. There was this capability. There was even the, uh, the courage to have that, especially thinking of Joshua. Yeah, right. I think on that almost for a specific goal in mind. Yes. Yeah. We very much see that in the Old Testament that it's that it's this individual, this Messiah type Messiah that was given, that was empowered for by the Spirit for a specific task, wasn't it? Moses especially. Great. Anything else? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Enlighten me. And and it's not coincidental that it's one Samuel sixteen, but um yeah. Absolutely. Yes. We're already seeing some differences between New and Old Testament, aren't we? Ooh, now I'm waiting. Yes, preach. <laughs> no, you're connecting the dots. 
Where was Jesus anointed? Where was he kind of his induction for ministry? The baptism. So it was kind of his anointing as well, wasn't it? We see other places where Jesus was actually anointed with oil, but um, you know, being baptized in the River Jordan, what do we see descend on Jesus as well? well the Spirit. Confirmation. Fulfillment. 1 Samuel 16, later in 16, giving the promise, no, 2 Samuel 16, of um, the one that will always sit on the throne of David. Um, a side question. So when people are baptized, they're anointed. Uh, because their old life dies, technically, and they're brought with a clean spirit. Technically. I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Even I'm like, sure, but anointed? I don't know. I'll have to go, just go double click on the word again. Um, but what is, what is probably unique in the scenario in the Old Testament and where, who the Spirit empowers? We spoke about it a little bit, but what is unique in who the Spirit empowers in the Old Testament? Leaders, Leaders yeah. Representatives. Um, Messiah type figures. Those that would do to do, and not even just leaders, but those who were to do a specific work of God. And also to deliver the message of God. Great. Prophet. Prophets. We see that no one can speak a prophecy without the Spirit of God actually giving them the ability to. Almost like a mediator. Which is Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Let's look at some New Testament passages. Mark 1. 11. Let's go down the... Where, where did we stop? Who read last? Yeah, so Mark 1 verse 11. Next to you, Luke 4 verse 14. And then Acts 1 verse 8. We're still thinking about empowering. We still... And then we get to match up the differences completely. Just get excited as so I run ahead. So let's listen to the work of the Spirit in the New Testament in terms of empowering. Go for it. Okay, Mark 1 in heaven. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Hmm. That just kind of gives us that inauguration, but okay. Luke 4. <laughs> Luke 4, but... 14, I think. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Jesus returned with the power of the Spirit and news about him has spread. Acts 1 is 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the That's great. How about Acts 4, verse 8? Ah, uh, she's at act, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get to you in a moment. Great. So, how does the Holy Spirit empower the New Testament? Yes! Immediately. Yes! Amen. What else? I, I wanted to go into a sermon mode, but I'm not allowed to right now, so. <laughs> what else? Spreading of the good news. And Spreading of the good news. Probably miracles and stuff that Jesus did as well, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Does that then mean before the baptism he was, to a sense, incapable of doing it because the Holy Spirit was not on him? Or was the Holy Spirit on him and he was just not, say, active? I don't know. What do you think? That sounds <laughs> the Holy Spirit was not with him in that active sense, but in the trying you, you it's difficult to separate the one from the other, but... Well, isn't that the first miracle, I think, is changing the water to wine? And that, I mean, he's very much an adult. 
even teaching as a child at the synagogue. Yeah, but yeah. how much of that is the Holy Spirit and how much of that is Jesus being God? <laughs> well, I was going to say what I was already going to say. Oh, yeah, yeah. So to add to that, um, I, I'm just assuming that maybe part of having the voice come down from heaven and the declaration is just so that everyone around could recognize who he was mm. and not necessarily that he wasn't empowered already, mm. but just for the sake of the witnesses around to recognize everything that was said before about him, that this is finally him. 100%. And so whether that is true, I mean, that's a whole other discussion. I simply don't know. But I do know what was the role of the baptism and the descending of the Spirit. It was more than just uh, empowering. It was actually a declaration of who Jesus is. It was a commencement of his ministry. It was an induction, a, a ceremony, if you will and to his royal ministry that he was busy with. And then immediately after that, we see Jesus spreading and talking about the kingdom of God. And um, it was a status given to Jesus that was confirmed at the resurrection as well. It's that whole idea of righteousness and righteous imputation from that title, this is my beloved sin, son in whom I am well pleased, that is now imputed to everyone else that is in Christ. And so much more than just an empowering, that is very much a confirmation. Yeah. So I don't know the other things. How does the empowering work of the Spirit in the Old Testament differ from the empowering work of the Spirit in the New Testament? So the Spirit empowered people for works in the Old Testament, and now He empowers people for work in the New Testament. How do they differ? Someone go. <laughs> <laughs> like, one of the first things that I definitely noticed is that the Old Testament is limited to certain chosen people, whereas in the New Testament, if you have faith in Christ, the Spirit is with you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Everyone is empowered immediately. <laughs> it's, guys, that's the words of Mark. He, he, if you go read Mark, he just says immediately. Immediately. <laughs> so, so Samson was empowered to deliver a message to the Philistines in battle. Yes, essentially. The fact that he beat them was a message. Absolutely, yeah. And him dying was another message, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, absolutely. But, but it's... Yeah, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, so let's wait. Yeah. Also, just to add on what you're saying, I don't know how relevant this is, but um, from some of the characters we see in the Old Testament, it seems like the Holy Spirit's empowerment is only for a specific task. Yes. And once that task is done, and he was gone. Unlike in the Holy New Testament, once you believe in Jesus, you, you empower the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't seem like he leaves until he's just there. <laughs> for like uh, the you life. use the words of the Old Testament until the task is done. <laughs> Yeah, because there is no well, task. Yes! But like, it just seems like there's a specific time frame for a particular task to be done. We'll form some of the characters we see and then... Well, maybe pastorally, this is, this is a good place to go to an old age home. I'm serious. Why are people still alive? They've still got a job to do. <laughs> Until the task is complete. <laughs> and, and you know why this is so important? It just gives purpose. Um, you know how many people struggle, not that I know, so please enlighten me, but um, after retirement, finding purpose in life. And the, the purpose and the empowering work of the, Christ, of the Spirit never retires. It, it changes seasons and the ministry looks different, but you never retire from the task that has been given you. And so in a sense, if you're still alive, it means that God still has some sort of function for you, whatever way that is. So it should help us in some sense to give some purpose as well. And if you're a Christian, then you have the power to fulfill that function as well, which is great. <laughs> Please share or push back. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Then we need. Great. What else? What, what is different? Um, Old Testament, New Testament, empowering the work of the Holy Spirit. 
How about how the Spirit manifests Himself in the New Testament? What are some of the manifestations that we have of the New Spirit, of the New Testament, that's different? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I, I fully agree with you. I think there's... And again, um, I'm trying to see where Grudem touches on that again. So, so it's a bit of a thorny issue for Grudem that he's struggling to deal with. Because for me, there's a conditionality to the working of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, and the condition was your obedience. And so as long as you were obedient in the Old Testament, and go test me on this, on Saul and the Samsons and all those guys, the Spirit indwelt and the Spirit could leave you as well. And yet there's some sense of that in the New Testament as well, where Grudem clearly shows, you know, by, grie by grieving the Holy Spirit, by continuing in disobedience, we might prove not to be Christians from the beginning. However, I do think that there's a difference in the permanence and the resting of the Holy Spirit on New Testament believers than on the Old Covenant people. And where we find this is actually within the unity of Christ. And now we're spilling into the doctrine of the preservation of the saints and effective calling. However, I think there's, it's definitely for me different in the, the conditions of which you receive the Spirit and have the Spirit on you versus the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's not dependent on our obedience. It's actually dependent on our ability to hold on to the grace of Christ. If it was obedient dependent, then we would go back to legalism and me earning the right to have the Holy Spirit within me. And that's Hebrews 13.5, the never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, always be with you until the end of the age. He who started the good work within you will bring it until fulfillment of this, I'm sure, to run the race until its completion. Who is the one that empowers us to do all of this? In fact, who is the one that gave us the ability to believe from the beginning? Even the faith that we have to believe in the grace of God is not, not our own doing. This is Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 10. So that no one may boast. Our ability to remember day in and day out that it is only through the gospel that we have salvation is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. To be able to do that tomorrow is because of the work of the Holy Spirit and working within us as a community. Sorry, I'm going to, so I just want to question. So in a sense, like, does that mean that we have more of an assurance now? Because if you're saying that before, if you were to commit sin and disobey, then the Spirit could leave you. Versus now, when we may still have indwelling sin and we're still struggling and yet we're not completely, we don't become unsaved or we don't get saved again. Or, Absolutely. And again, I don't know where this is in the notes, but it's somewhere in here <laughs> where it's referenced that the Spirit is referred to as the guarantee of our salvation. He is the down payment for us one day spending eternity with God. That's very different to what I'm seeing the work and the role of the Holy Spirit is within the Old Covenant. Now for me, and this is not Grudem, I think it's got something to do with the holy nature of God and how to be unified with a sinful people. How the Spirit wasn't able to fully be unified with a sinful people in the Old Testament. It was only and could only happen after the sacrifice and righteous imputation of Jesus that we could acquire unity with God through the Holy Spirit. Very much in the same way that people weren't able to enter into the temple and to, into the Holy of Holies. We are now the temple of God and we have been cleansed and it's only because of the cleansing that the Spirit of God could now descend on the new temple. So we basically got direct access to God now through Jesus. And we Absolutely. Know, in the Old Testament, you had to go to the temple, you had to do sacrifices, all that stuff. That's sacrifice it. Sacrifice is done now. So we've got, it's like there's a, more full, a fuller sense of Holy Spirit. Holy, uh, uh, Holy Spirit. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> but it's so much more than having a direct phone line to God. In what way was the temple in the Old Testament not a phone line to God? What, what was the role of the temple? What happened at the temple? And what was the role of the Spirit at the temple? 
We're so far off notes, we might as well just continue. <laughs> God with them. Yes, but what, what actually happened at the temple in the Old Testament? Offerings. Offerings, but the Spirit, what was the role of the Spirit? He filled, in what way? How was it visible? Smoke, the cloud. You guys remember the cloud that first went to Mount Sinai and then when the tabernacle was there, the rushing of the wind of the cloud that filled it. Do you remember when it was exited? That was in Ezekiel and when they were actually carried away in Babylon and the, the cloud actually lifted from the temple and God's Spirit exited from the temple. So the, it wasn't that they could now talk to God and intercede. They were then with actually physically present with God. Which is a crazy thing. If you remember, I chatted with someone the other day saying, you know, just be careful to say God spoke with me. I mean, people died when God spoke. <laughs> like literally. The mountain, if an animal touched the mountain, bang. <laughs> people touch it, kill them. Uh, people, it was a frightening thing to be in the vicinity of the place where God spoke to someone else. Yo, now think about that spirit indwelling us and us not talking to him in heaven but there has to be some empowering not just for the work that we've got to do but there's got to be some revelation and manifestation of the presence of God where I am right now. Try to grasp that. Try to, try to grapple with that in the work of the Holy Spirit. And if it wasn't for the unity with Christ, we would be obliterated, incinerated. Every molecule just kind of vanished. Every electron out of its ventral barn and gone. Okay, the Holy Spirit doesn't just empower. It also purifies. <laughs> Let's read John 16, verses 8 to 11. Devet, your next up, ne? Yeah. Okay. Um, next, uh, after you've read, when are we? Oh, 1 Corinthians 6 11, and then Galatians 5 22 to 23. You can recite it or read it. Um, yes. The Holy Spirit that purifies. Let's learn. John 16 8 to 11. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. This, this is an interesting part. So the he, that's the Paracleo, Paracletos, the helper that Jesus will send, he will convince the world of sin. Okay, interesting. What is the role of the Spirit then in terms of purification? Who does he purify? Just do business with that verse right there. <laughs> the believers, believers are in the world. Believers are in the world? Sure. Now, we don't know to what degree and what way and how, but, but to some degree, us coming to the knowledge that we are sinful, again, this just highlights it. Who is the one that's at work in doing that? Well, it's the Spirit. And so in a sense, it's the Spirit working with both believers and non-believers to show us something of God, to remind us something of God. It's interesting, isn't it? You know practically how great a effect that is or the solace that it can give you um, at the end of the day no matter how well you dis, uh, disciple or evangelize the only person that can fully convince and convict someone of their sin and their need of the savior is the holy spirit which one becomes we don't become fatalistic or depressed we actually just become more prayerful that's why we pray because god actually responds to prayer that's why we pray in the Spirit and to the Spirit to convince someone of their sin. 
But it should encourage us when we become discouraged in our own ability and in the fact that we can't turn someone. We had a singles night Friday night and I spoke about, you know, the whole missionary dating. I'm going to date him to convert him to Christian. The fallacy within that is the thing that we credit ourselves with so much that we can actually turn someone to Christ. We are but witnesses. We are but instruments in the Redeemer's hands. But at the end of the day, don't give yourself too much credit. It's the work of the Spirit. I think, we, I think something also to remember in that light is that if someone does not accept Jesus, Amen. it's not your witnessing that there's something wrong and you don't go home and cry about it and you think, <laughs> I should have said this yes. I should have done that. That's it. You deliver the gospel and if the Holy Spirit does the convincing, then you have a new believer. Amen. And if not, it's not your it's not your witnessing. It should take away our insecurities and our people's answers why they cannot go and evangelize and actually share. It's like, no, you're giving yourself way too much credit that you think you're too bad to do this. Because thereby saying that you can somehow be good in doing this. <laughs> Obviously, this strategy and wisdom and Paul is even contextual in the way that he goes and shares the gospel. But, but still, the fundamental fact, who can and should? Everyone that's a believer. When? Immediately. Love that. You wanted to say something. Well, I just wanted to add that it's so true that really it is the work of the Holy Spirit because there are many people who can read the Word of God. It does nothing to them. And yes. It's just words. And it's just, you know, black and white. And it just does nothing. But if you're someone who does become a bit of the Holy Spirit, you can read those words and it really does impact you and it makes you see something. It's like scales are removed from your eyes and you can see, wait a minute, something is wrong. Wow. But another person could, it's, I've spoken with so many different people who know they can even quote the word better than me, and, but they don't believe and they don't see how simple they are. And again, rather than this discouraging us to missions, this is the same as predestination. Because God has called and will call some, it's actually an encouragement to missions, saying, well, he will, some will react. But how much are you praying before you're actually having this discussion with someone? How, how much are you having other people intercede and praying? How much is there intercessory prayer for sermons and these things happening? Or how much do we believe, but in the way that we do this, and the way that we create the right atmosphere? Again, there's wisdom in all these things. I'm not saying that, but fundamentally, where does it lie? Great. Let's read on. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Great. Who is sanctified? <laughs> uh, the believers. The believers. <laughs> Grace. And it's interesting, the role of the Spirit and of the Son in that. You just want to read that, kind of that bit of justified by Jesus and the Spirit or something. Just read that again. Um, but you were washed sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In the name of the Lord, by the Spirit. That's cool. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Yes, please. Double for, two for one. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, So good. Let's also get 2 Corinthians 3.18 whilst we're talking about this. So how does the Spirit purify? What does the Spirit purify? So, yeah. If, if you're at 2 Corinthians 3.18, yeah, you're, you're quick. Right? <laughs> and before, who with unveiled faces contemplating the Lord's glory were being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. <laughs> just read that again <laughs> so so i know the concept of beholding is becoming but that's just again there was a lot of nuances in that just read that again and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the lord's glory and being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the lord who is the spirit who wants to double click on that verse just what are you guys hearing about the role of the spirit Mm, specifically the transforming. 
Hmm. I just want to mention something about the Old Testament. Go, go for it. <laughs> the unveiling. That veil's been pulled because of Christ. Yes. Yeah, and we're hearing about the veil again. Who else veiled his face? Moses. Moses. Okay. He, Paul is being, he's doing some trickery there in the way that he's quoting it. But uh, yeah, definitely. Oh. I wonder who tore the veil. Did, like, was the spirit like them? <laughs> Did something? Or in anyway. <laughs> Great. What else? Uh, so, so transform us into the same I image. Man, what does that pastorally mean for us? Practically, what does that mean for us? That the spirit is the one that transforms us into the same image of Christ. So, it's interesting, when you read the Old Testament, um, and the, pack, the, the place that it talks about it, it says that people were frightened to look at Moses. And so he covered his face. Paul retells it slightly different. He says, so that people would not see that the shining of his face was fading away. He covered it. He was, he was losing the shining. <laughs> but he was, he was, he, he's kind of losing that effect. And he wasn't able to directly look at God. God said, hey, I'm going to cover myself up, otherwise you're going to die. And so we're different. We, we unveiled faces. We're not being covered. We're not going to lose this. We're not like Paul that's afraid that we're going to lose this anointing. And we're beholding God, which Moses wasn't able to do. God had to shield him. In the cleft of the rock. In the cleft of the rock. And so we've got this clear, clearer picture, clearest picture of who God is because Jesus said, He, those who have seen me, have seen the Father. And the more that we see who Jesus is, as we see him, the act of seeing him, beholding, that act actually transforms us more into that image. And yet this is done by the work of the Spirit. So who's the one that's allowing us to see Christ? It's the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is more clearly and progressively revealing to us and showing to us and beholding to us who Jesus is. And as we realize that more, as we figuratively, maybe literally, even beholding Jesus and the grace and what He's done, that's the thing that actually transforms our hearts. And think about what this means pastorally and practically for us as we fight sin. Very clearly, we've got to bear fruit, and the Spirit does that as well. Very clearly, we do need to change and be transformed. But yet, it doesn't seem like it's obedience and the law and the ability on our side that's going to be the thing that does that. And so as I'm struggling with sin, I don't just want to sit back and say, Spirit, do your work. There is an active thing, but it's... But it's me in conjunction with the Spirit wanting to see Jesus more clearly. And where is he clearer seen ever? Well, it's great in Mark where Jesus is kind of revealed. Who's the first one that kind of gets it that this is the Son of God? Well, it's the God who crucified him right next to him. Seeing what everything happened, seeing the Son on the cross as he died and all the signs, he was like, truly, this is the Son of God. It's, it, it's monumental how the image of the cross, the act that was happening on the cross, was the clearest picture of who Jesus was, is, and what he did. And the work of the Spirit is to show us that more in its entirety and how that works out in our life. And what is the one single word that will take the rest of our lives to understand? It's grace. Unmerited, undeserved grace. Every time and in every situation, whether it's through fear or insecurity or our own effort, everything that we try to do is earn and show and prove. And the cross takes away everything about that. Even the brother or sister that's being discouraged and they walk with Christ feeling that they're not being transformed. A great exercise or thing to do. We don't have wind here, but think about the Cape or even... Uh, the coast where you've got some of those trees, you know, a lot of wind is blowing, so those things are growing really skew. But over the time, even though the wind is kind of skewing the growth of the tree, you do see some upward trend. 
Uh, a lot of the time, that's our sanctification lives as well, that um, we are transformed, we are growing, but it doesn't feel like we're growing that quickly. But we often focus on this week or this year, kind of in this time period, and we're focusing on this piece of branch that's just kind of growing level right now. A good exercise to do for those who have been Christians, let's say, five years, are you the same person that you've been five years ago? Has there been some growth? If they are Christian, you will see some growth. The encouragement then is, oh, so you must have the Spirit in you. That can't come from you. So you've got the living God and the living Spirit in you. It's amazing. Consequently, if there's no growth, okay, maybe we don't understand the gospel. It's not try harder. Maybe you think you're believing the gospel, but you don't know what you're believing, or maybe you don't fully understand this. So the encouragement, the turning back to, the solution, the correction, everything then is the gospel. It's interesting, no matter what the advice, whether it's a sinner or a Christian in need of grace, it's always going to return back to the cross. The message, never gonna, it's never going to change. And it's only when we really believe that it's the work of the Spirit. If we don't believe this, again, now it gets to self-effort and what we should do as a church or what you should do in this, these spaces. Hopefully some of you guys are erring to the side of you. Can't just lean on grace, no? <laughs> but Paul is very clear on this. <laughs> oh man, we should be done. <laughs> Let's talk about, and we're going to shoot from the hip. What else does the Holy Spirit do in the New Testament? Hello, Devil. Oh, we, we, we've got one minute. Uh, Raymond, this um, the series The Chosen. Yes. Season two starts with how did this, uh, John write him down and how did the disciples remember fondly what happened 30 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. But it's it's such a cool. <laughs> Actually, what Jesus is trying to tell them is, if the Holy Spirit comes, I'll be closer to you than I'm right now. Oh! Because they were actually looking for him in the city, so he was a kilometer from them. But with the Holy Spirit coming, Jesus is closer to us. Yes. Than, so that's just most scenes I'm, I'm happy with there, but, but that's what I'm happy with. You have, I haven't seen it, so okay. thanks. <laughs> Uh, so the Holy Spirit reveals and reminds. And is the internal testimony about that we are Christians? Yes. And I, and I do believe in the context in John 16, I think, that that is said. Um, it more specifically also relates to the office of the apostle, the, the guys who wrote the New Testament. It's like, man, this Holy Spirit is going to work in you. It's, it's not just going to be remembrance. Yes, there's going to be through your narrative, but um, Holy Spirit 100% at work. Yeah. Great. What else? What does the Holy Spirit do for us in the New Testament? He guides us. It, he guides us. Yes. Great. Which was interesting in Buddha, he said, not, it's not only guidance in like the law, being moral. It's like guidance in your every decision you make. Yes. You need to listen. To you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I needed to read that again. Yeah. I, I think I do think that we um No, this is true. I was just kind of testing myself if I'm going off the rails. But but I do think there is a sense in which um almost learning to listen to the voice of the Spirit and the and the nudgings of the Spirit and the pointing and the guiding of the Holy Spirit becomes easier over time. And again, this is Ephesians five eighteen. Let's talk about that quickly. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? But let's read the whole verse. Someone go to Ephesians 5.18. Because I do think that actually the description of what you shouldn't do is the descriptor of what we should do. And I've got a bottle in the car right now. so Jake, you have it? Oh, you just remember because you know what I... I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm a red man. So, what did I say? What are we talking about? It's like, uh, it's like uh, Stephen. Oh, yes, 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 yes. He was stoned. 
it also says that he was full of the Holy Spirit. That's right. How can I see in you that you are full of the Holy Spirit? I like that. So it must be the fruit. It must be the fruit. What we read in one verse, the fruit, uh, Let's quickly, who's got Ephesians 5.18? Great. Um, do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. It's interesting that the two sides of the pole. So do not be filled with vine, wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Why do you think those two are put in conjunction with one another? Uh, I think wine influences your decision. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think it's the flesh versus the spirit in Galatians 5 as well. Yes. It's like that directly opposed. You always have a choice. Yes. You choose the spiritual one or you're going to choose the flesh one. And so um, Galatians actually has two ways uh, in 5.18 and 25. 5.25 it says keep in step with the spirit. Um, other translation says let your life be dictated by the spirit. And so... Being filled with wine, you are controlled by wine and by the alcohol. You actually don't have the necessary offices to make your decisions and to make the right ones. And so it's safe to say then the opposite of that would be to be controlled or to be guided or to give influence over to the work of the Spirit. I'm not saying that's, that's fully what it means to be filled, but at least it seems like it's heading in a direction where we allow the work of the Holy Spirit to be more evident and be controlled in our lives. And you guys are doing spiritual disciplines tonight, aren't you? So one of the fruits is self-control? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very important thing. 100% it is. <laughs> because it's directly opposed to what the flesh actually wants to do. Okay, we didn't finish, not even close, but it's fine. Any last observations? Sorry that we didn't finish or get even close, but it's good. Well, you guys are basically going to go over into the work of the Holy Spirit now in spiritual disciplines. But um, there is something in the, the part that we play within our flesh to allow the work of the Spirit to take control. And, and sometimes we overemphasize the work of the flesh and sometimes we overemphasize the work of the Spirit. Sometimes we overemphasize the work of discipline versus the Spirit empowering and revealing and giving us. But it's very much an engine that, you know, the one runs on the other. But similar to what they said, it's very important to see the order in which Paul greeted his church. He normally says two things to them. This and this to you. You guys know what he says? He says, grace and peace to you. He never says peace and grace. He always says grace and peace. And it's super important why. Without grace, there can be no peace. And so it's the same in the way that we experience the power, the revelation, the working, and at the end of the day, the fruit of the Spirit. Through grace, there's peace. And it's in peace that the Spirit works. Amen. Guys, let's take a three-minute break.